there's an asteroid headed straight for us. Who could save us at a time like this? Stand back, citizen. The Hubbler. This looks like a job for me and my turbo encabulator. It's Hubble time. Look, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but after watching the latest Marvel movie, I just don't feel anything. I see a bunch of action figures on screen with explosions. It doesn't do anything for me, other than on a sensory level. And there's only so many times that can be done. Or at least that's my opinion. I would prefer something to get me thinking, to get me to leave the theater and want to act. My God. What's this? Alienation? Dialectic? What are these words? I don't know them, but they excite and entice me. Maybe this is the answer to my prayers. It's Tom part of the ladder, but here he is. Risking life with them. Hey everybody, Graham back at it again. Now, you may not know it to look at me, but I have indeed taken a theater class or two in my time. <laughs> That's why I'm on YouTube. As you know, here at Hubble, we try to take a deeper look at things we're familiar with or point out some things we might not have known about. And if that's interesting to you, you know what to do. So today I wanna to talk about Bertolt Brecht and epic theater, or as it's also known, dialectical theater which in 1920s Germany seemed to be awfully revolutionary. But then why don't we talk about it so much now? Well, I think epic theater has died a slow death. It has been steadily poisoned just like Daniel Day-Lewis in The Phantom Thread. Sorry, spoiler alert. To get to the bottom of epic theater, we need to start with the guy who invented it. Bertolt Brecht was born in Augsburg, Germany before moving to Berlin to work as a playwright and theater practitioner. Well, when that one guy came into power, you know, the one with the comb over the mustache. Uh... Brecht fled because he was a pretty devoted fan of Karl Marx, and that's putting it lightly. He went to Scandinavia first and then to the US, but him being a communist did not do him any favors in the US, and after a few years he was subpoenaed by the House Committee of Un-American Activities. I am uh, written a number of poems and songs and plays in the fight against Hitler. And then he went to East Berlin, where he practiced theater until his death in 1956. The term epic comes from the ancient epic poems, usually recounting historical events while increasing the drama and excitement for the audience, which, I don't know, doesn't always come through when you're reading it for a high school English class. She should have died here, he, here, hereafter. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this Petty pace from day to day. All right, Mr. King, that's enough. You're about to murder the bard. The soliloquy itself goes something like this, class. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. Epic theater is generally considered to be a rebellion against Aristotle, the father of our understanding of narrative and his use of the three-act structure, or beginning, middle, and end, his use of catharsis, the strong feeling of emotion, and his use of mimesis, or imitation, where the audience has a strong emotional output and then imitates it, in a way. For now, I want to discuss some big brain concepts that can help us to understand the approach of the epic and how that differs from its dramatic counterparts. The first key term is the Verfremdungseffekt, or V effect, or in English, alienation. And this is a tough one. Is Brecht suggesting that he wants to alienate the audience or the actors from the characters? That seems kind of counterintuitive, right? 
Well, that's because the alienation or uh, distanciation, I think we're calling it less and less alienation these days because the idea isn't really to alienate the audience. Um, it's to give them, it's to give them critical distance. Okay, Brian, geez. That's Brian Jennings, the head of the theater department at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, and under whose tutelage many have become professional actors. Not me, though. A man stands on a ladder in front of a quiet audience. Anyway, the function of alienation is to bring a critical distance between the actors and their characters, as well as between the audience and the performance. It is used in order to wake up and activate the audience, to remind them that the real world is actually outside the doors of the theater. The audience is supposed to constantly question what's happening and make connections in their own minds. Whatever could it mean? They should not relate to the events in a way that might make them passive, but rather react in the opposite. Brecht says that the audience of the epic should laugh when the characters cry and should cry when the characters laugh. Now, the second key term is dialectic, which epic theater is also called. The dialectic is a process where two ideas are pitted against one another to get closer to the truth of the matter. Perhaps like two people arguing to find some common ground, assuming that the middle ground is more true than either of the extremes. Many of his plays feature a trial scene for that reason, so that there's a dramatic frame where these ideas can be tried against each other. Colonel Jessup, did you call in the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! My first assumption was that this was a back and forth between the audience and the performers. But this example of the trial scene is very illuminating as to how the dialectic works in practice. But, of course, there is a bit of dialectic going on between the audience and the players on stage as well. This is dreadful! See? Dialectic. Now, don't get me wrong. There are so many other big terms like gestus and fable. I could go on and on, but in my limited experience, the dialectic and distanciation are the most prominent and the most salient terms from which all of the others bloom. Distanciation or alienation or estrangement are not for the purpose of kicking people out of the theater, but rather to draw attention to the play and its various mechanisms. He wants you to feel for these characters. He wants you to feel for the situations economic, political, social, in which they have found themselves. Um, but he doesn't necessarily want you disabled by your own emotional life. He doesn't want you to leave the theater emotionally shattered. He wants you to leave the theater activated and ready to move on the world. I just want to get out in the world and make a YouTube channel to affect change. Great. So we've got the basic theory in place for me to make some broad statements about what epic theater is, right? Well. Let's take a quick look at some illustrated examples from Brecht himself, and also try to apply some of this to the real world, either through film or just how to put the concepts of epic into practice. So in Brecht's essay, Theater for Learning, he compares epic theater to drama by saying, where dramatic theater incarnates an event, epic theater relates one. Dramatic theater shows the world as it is, while epic theater shows the world as it is becoming. Further on from this, dramatic theater promotes the audience to react in ways such as, This is great art. Everything in it is self-evident. Or, I weep with the weeping and I laugh with the laughing. Or, Oh yes, I have felt that too. While epic theater brings the audience to realize this is great art, nothing in it is self-evident. I laugh at the weeping and I weep at the laughing. I would not have thought that. With these examples, we can get a bit of a clearer understanding of how epic theater works. 
On top of this, epic theater does not move in the same pattern as a classical three act or Aristotelian, if you will, structure. The idea of epic, as Brecht's contemporary Alfred Dublin said, could be cut up with scissors, and each of which would stand alone. Elsewhere, it's hard to find work that completely encompasses the idea of the epic. It has since dissolved into fragments, which we can see as examples in a lot of places, but we don't see the epic singularly expressed. This is partially because Brecht did not consider the epic to be complete. Much like he says, epic shows the world as it is becoming, he too was showing this idea of epic theater as it was becoming. This is only the beginning. So I would suggest that generally, very political films can fit into the mold of the epic, although they often rely on pathos to activate the audience but also elements of David Lynch or Lars von Trier's work can be understood as epic as the audience has to make connections and are left alone and maybe feeling a bit alienated. To me, epic theater still seems like a revolutionary concept. It's hard to grasp. It's almost an impossible ideal to strive toward and it's died a slow death as its own overarching theory, but has nonetheless bled into the methods that actors can use to represent a character. Whether you want to evoke this emotional response in an audience, or whether you want to evoke a critical response in the audience, it all comes back to truth. And everybody is striving for truth in their own way. Both the dialectic and distanciation have proved to be useful tools to make the audience members more active participants. It shouldn't necessarily be applied to every work. I mean, it's still nice to get a bit of catharsis every once in a while. Another day saved. This may only be the beginning of the movie, but by the end, when all seems lost, the Hubbler will save the day again. And you, dear audience, will feel relief. But the duty of art is still to be good for us, to make us think critically about the world we live in. So the next time you feel a bit alienated from a movie or a play, ask yourself, is this on purpose? Shh. Thanks for watching, and a big thanks to Brian Jennings for his patience while I ever so slowly grasped epic theater. I did most of my research from the Brecht Sourcebook, which is an amazing collection of essays by Brecht and many other theater critics, historians, and the like. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy watching me struggle to comprehend things. And we'll see you next week. He's talking to himself as he slowly goes all the way up the ladder with both feet this time, turning back to the audience, making sure he's safe on the ladder. It doesn't seem like the greatest idea to stand at the top is the top part of the ladder, but here he is, risking life and limb.